Growing up in a small city in the south of England, New York seemed impossibly glamorous. It was the city of bands like The Strokes, Yeah Yeah Yeahs, and LCD Sound System, who all had such an influence on British guitar music in the early 2000s. It's a mix of internationalism, experimentation, glamour and danger, plus cheap rents that facilitated an artistic community that led to the birth of some of the biggest genres in music today. I've been coming to this city since I was 17, and it's always had an incredible hold on me. So with time to spare back in January, I thought I'd take a tour of some of New York's musical landmarks. Now, because I was only there for a few days, there are some notable omissions, Greenwich Village being one. Hopefully, we'll get to do that in another video soon. The New York City skyline is the birthplace of disco, hip-hop, punk, doo-wop, and new wave. It's a city that's responsible for an incredibly diverse range of artists from Blondie to the Beastie Boys and home to many iconic venues. We don't know much about the musical lives of the early indigenous peoples or Dutch settlers who inhabited what became New York City, but when the British invaded in 1664, they brought opera and classical music with them. From the early 19th century, Italian opera was the name of the game. In the early 20th century, it was jazz and blues. In the 30s and 40s, swing and big band. The 50s and 60s saw the birth of rock and roll. The 70s was incredibly rich time musically, as disco, post-punk and hip-hop all emerged emerged from the city's streets. At block parties in the Bronx, DJ Cool Herc's innovative use of two turntables and two copies of the same record, switching back and forth to isolate and elongate the instrumental portion of the record that emphasised the drum beat, called The Break, changed modern music forever. The 80s was a time for pop music as well as more experimental music like acid jazz. In the 90s, hip hop dominated with rappers like The Notorious B.I.G. and Nas releasing seminal works. In 2001, The Strokes released their debut album, Is This It?, that had a seismic effect on post-millennium guitar music. Here we go, Broadway theatre. Broadway professional Yiddish theatre companies began performing in the district in 1882. By the early 20th century, Broadway had become one of the preeminent locations for musical theatre in the world and produced a body of songs that led to the era 1914 to 1950 to be called the Golden Age of Songwriting. 1943 saw Rodgers and Hammerstein pioneer a new form of narrative storytelling with Oklahoma. Stephen Sondheim, who grew up on the Upper West Side and began his incredible career writing the lyrics to West Side Story in 1957, then reinvents the American musical, becoming one of the most influential American writers and composers of all time. In the late 80s, early 90s, British imports like Les Miserables and The Phantom of the Opera dominated. But American issues soon swung back into focus as Hamilton by Lin-Manuel Miranda, undoubtedly the most important musical of our era, originated off-Broadway at the Public Theatre in 2015 before conquering the world. Our next venue is the Apollo Theatre in Harlem. Opening in 1914, the Apollo Theatre has seen the emergence of the quintessentially American genres of blues, jazz, R&B, gospel and soul. Located at 253 West 125th Street, it was originally a burlesque venue, but soon redirected its attention to serving the interests of the growing African-American community in Harlem. In 1963, James Brown recorded Live at the Apollo, ranked number 25 on Rolling Stone magazine's 500 Greatest Albums of All Time. Brown recorded three more albums and a television special at the theatre, helping popularise it as a venue for live recordings. In 2006, his body was laid to rest on its stage and tens of thousands of people queued to pay their respects. These days, it's a not-for-profit venture, doing community outreach work, film screenings and lectures, as well as concerts, roughly 1.3 million and people visit every year. Next, Carnegie Hall. In terms of bucket list music venues for me to play one day, the idea of standing up on stage at Carnegie Hall just with an acoustic guitar and a few condenser mics. Well, ooh, if I'm being really spoiled, I would have a string quartet or a string octet with me. How awesome would that be? I am miles away. <laughs> from that dream, but maybe. We all know the joke, right? I'm not going to say it, although I want to. Carnegie Hall is a concert venue in Midtown Manhattan at 881 7th Avenue. 
it is regarded as one of the most prestigious venues in the world for both classical and popular music. It officially opened in 1891 with a concert conducted by the Russian composer Tchaikovsky in his American debut. Its main hall was home to the New York Philharmonic from 1892 until 1962. Many of the great musicians and orchestras in classical and contemporary music have played here since. Rock and roll music first graced its stages when Bill Haley and his Comets appeared in a Variety Benefit concert in 1955. The Beatles performed two shows in 1964 on their first visit to the States. It presents close to 250 performances a year, and while the pandemic forced the longest shutdown in its history, it continues to be a shining beacon for aspiring performers. Like, like me. CBGB. I think I found CBGBs, if I can get over the snow. And 315 Bowery. It is a clothes shop. Founded on the Bowery in New York City by Hilly Crystal in 1973, CBGB was originally intended for country, bluegrass and blues, hence the name, but became the iconic home of American punk and new wave bands like the Ramones, Blondie and Talking Heads. In the 80s, it welcomed hardcore bands, followed by pop punk in the 90s. Patti Smith played the final concert in October 2006 as the club closed due to an ongoing battle over unpaid rent. Now occupied by a fashion store, the site remains a mecca for music fans. Studio 54. I'm hoping this is actually the right Studio 54. I think I've got it right. <laughs> Don't shout at me in the comments if I've got it wrong, but it should be down here. So Roundabout Theatre Company are now based here. Cool. Studio 54. Many legendary icons walked through those doors. Disco was born in the underground basements and lofts of private invite-only parties, frequented by outcasts looking for a place of their own before becoming a global phenomenon. It's in New York City that the practice of beat matching was born, a technique of pitch shifting, synchronising the beats and bars so that two tracks flow into one seamless mix. No more pauses between songs, just wall-to-wall -wall music. The technique was originated by Francis Grasso, aka DJ Francis, in clubs like Salvation and Sanctuary. Other legendary DJs like Larry Levin at Soho's Paradise Garage highly influenced the model of those nights out. Dancing was encouraged over talking and the DJ the centre of the attention. These clubs were short-lived, but had a seismic influence on modern music. One club in particular became world famous, opened in 1977. Studio 54 was located on 54th Street in Midtown Manhattan. The guests were glamorous, drug use was shameless, and the balcony was known as the place to be if you felt like getting amorous. The list of celebrity patrons is long, but included Al Pacino, Donald Trump, George Michael and Mick Jagger, among others. Lasting just three years, the club shut down after its founders were convicted for evading taxes. But as one of the biggest and best known nightclubs in the world, it had a huge effect on popularising disco and club culture. Thank you for watching this video to the end. I really, really appreciate it and let me know if you want more like it. I also know it's a cliche, but if you aren't yet subscribed, would you please please do so. It's free and it totally helps me out. Another thing that's free is signing up to my newsletter. Check out the link in the description below. Then if you are feeling generous, take a look at my Nebula channel, my online music courses and my Patreon page, as that's how I support myself making free content here on YouTube. But as always, I'll be seeing you here very, very soon.